board and and he was the mouthpiece, the messenger of probably one of the greatest revivals in the last 100 years. Just an incredible um, man of God who preached Christ and him crucified, who preached the gospel, who knew the gospel of the kingdom and preached repentance. And I was convicted every time I'd listened to one of his messages I was convicted, but also filled with such joy and freedom. Every time I heard him speak, it was like, wow, it's just, he speaks with such a clarity, and it's a simple message, but it's the truth. And, it, and I just felt so charged. I'd walk away from, from listening to a recording, just so built up, and going, man, this guy preaches Christ. He preaches the truth. He doesn't hold back. He's not wimpy. He's a man's man. Uh, and he doesn't have to be a lumberjack to be a man's man, you know? Anyway, don't know why I was going down that direction. Uh, I'm really thankful for everything that's been shared and preached, testimonies that have been shared. You know, Cheryl and I received lots of testimonies from lives transformed throughout the year. So I think it's great to what we did this morning, just reflect. and That wasn't even on my radar, seriously. I, I came here not even thinking to do that, but as I sat down, it was like, no, no, we, we must. We had to. It was meant to happen. That was, that was what was sent of God. And that's why it's important as, as ministers, which you are of the gospel, if you're saved and you're born again, you're now a minister of the gospel. You're, you're called to be a priest. We're called to be a kingdom of priests. Amen. Revelation 1.6, Revelation 5.10, uh, Exodus 19.10. I know these verses because I read my Bible. We're meant to know the word. Meant to, when squeezed, the word should come out. And so if I can use that phrase, kingdom of priests, I ought to know where it is in the scripture. Because someone might challenge me and say, where does it say that? I just go straight to Exodus 19.10. Um, Moses will say that um, after he's just received the law on Mount Sinai. And we see that John the Apostle would say the same words in Revelation chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 5. Same language. It's Whenever we... We're, in doubt or confusion about who God is, you'll find that there's multiple vessels in the Bible that use the same words. It's the same language. Which is a real comfort, isn't it? And Jesus would say, you know, about having two or three witnesses confirming. Let it come out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let everything be established. And God would have multiple witnesses throughout your Bible saying the same thing to you. So um, I want to speak a little bit on what we spoke on last week, which is the apostolic living that's required of the body of Christ. And, and when I say the body of Christ, that it's another phrase, another Christianese, another way of saying church, isn't it? They're synonymous. Those words, the body of Christ and the church, are kind of the same thing. And we throw those words around a lot, but but there is a true body of Christ. There is a true church. And I know we don't like to hear it, there's a false body and there's a false church. That's a struggle for a lot of Christians. Oh, that's too judgy, brother. You can't say that. Have you read your Bible? There is a false church. There are false brethren or false brothers in the faith. There are false Christians. Yeah, that's, that's okay. We can't be bugged out by it. That's just reality. It's like there's night and there's day. We can't get bugged out by the night. We have to live with it 
and, and we have to grow and recognize um, the, the place that we dwell, that we indwell, which is this life, this reality, and not be offended by the hard things necessarily or the things less palatable to our hearing, to our minds, and even to our family and our friends. What I just said will set you free from the fear of man. So I want to touch on restoration in the apostolic ministry. The apostolic is, is very concerned with foundations very concerned with everything that has passed every moment that's led up to today in your life quite possibly has led up to this moment right now a truly apostolic woman man, child of God is concerned about all their moments in time. So nothing's by accident. So all your moments leading up to this moment have meaning. And with that in view, all the future yet moments yet to be fulfilled also have meaning. You will live a different way because you're considering the future. And you'll be burdened with the, the end of all things. The apostolic person is going to be considering what's yet to come. That's always in view. The end of everything is always in view to the apostolic man or woman of God. And to excuse yourself from anything that's difficult to consider is no longer apostolic. You've come into airy, fairy, fluffy believerism. So anything that reduces or, or discounts the end of the age or discounts any, anything that's contrary to a polite believerism that would just have you go to church Sunday after Sunday, year after year, decade after decade, without any change, any transformation, anything becoming like Christ into fullness or unto fullness is, is playing games. Yeah? It's a mockery. So in 1999, I got on my knees and I prayed, God, what am I to do? What is my job? And a voice from heaven said, my messenger. That's it. There was no ifs, buts or pleases. Would you like to be a messenger? Would you like to be a pastor? Would you like to be a teacher, an evangelist? Would you like to be... Uh, on the choir? Would you like to be a worship leader? Would you like to be a prophet and then become an apostle and then become a teacher? Would you like... None of it. You're my messenger. That's it. That's all I heard. Now, you might hear something different for yourself, but all I heard was messenger. And so I'm concerned with now the the one who gives the message, the source of the message, and the audience of the message. That's it. My life got really simple. And, and so by nature of being a messenger means I need to be, like Paul would say in Philippians chapter 3, having his citizenship or his place of living, his dwelling in heaven, spiritually. Now, we do, we, we often agree to it as Christians that, that, yes, that's where you are, brother. When you're born again, you're saved, and your citizenship is now in heaven. Amen. 
But how often are we actually living from that place? How often are we thinking from that place? How often do we see things from that place? How often do we challenge things that are not in that place in our own lives? So we have to be seated in heavenly places where the Lord is in all our moments, in our preceding moments, our current, present moments, and yet our future moments. They're all meant to be from that eternal place. You're not meant to live here. Yeah? This is temporal. This is all passing away. This is all going. And your real life is hidden with Christ, in Christ, and it's in the eternal realm. That changes everything. It changed everything for me when I heard those verses. And I read those verses over and over. And I would look at people's lives who were living from that place. Suddenly they weren't fearful about what people thought of them. They weren't fearful about what others would speak of them or say of them. Or they, they lived in another sphere. They lived in another realm, which was where we're all meant to live. Anybody that names the name of the Lord should be living from that place. So to be part of what is apostolic is concerned with every historical moment right back to Adam. You will be concerned with what Eve and Adam were doing in the garden. You will be concerned with their sons. You'll be concerned with Cain and Abel. You'll be concerned with Moses. You'll be concerned with Abraham. You'll be concerned with David. You'll be concerned with Zephaniah and Zechariah. These things will concern you. You will, you will probably eagerly search into these precious men and women of the Bible and mine out for yourself and for your own generation the reality of everything that preceded your date of birth. So Melvin's a, an historian, loves history. That's a precious grace. And it's often overlooked and, and people will put people to one side or put them into a category of, well, they just need to get on with you know, where we are today and, and where we're going tomorrow and not look at the past. God would say no. God gave us all a Bible and said, I'm very concerned with the past. And you ought to be also because I've taught you everything about me in the past. To prevent you from making those same mistakes that these people did in the past, you have, you have the Bible given to you in your own language, in your own typeface, you know, a size 10 font, if you like, or 12 font, you can get a large print edition. <laughs> the older we get. <laughs> right, there you go. Yeah. So he's done that. He's provided for this generation so much. And yet so much of my travels throughout the church world, I, I don't know many people who know their Bible. And those who do often have a, a skewed idea of it and not looking at the fullness of the, the picture. So we've got words like kingdom. We've got words like gospel. We've got words like the body of Christ. We've got all these Christian terms and words, but what do, what do they mean to me? That's important. To everybody in this room, what does this mean to me? What does the kingdom of God mean? Have you asked yourself that question? Because you're it to this generation. This generation isn't going to know the kingdom of God unless you explain it to them. Do you know what the kingdom of God is? How would I define it? Put on the, on the spot right now. If the spotlight came on, we spun the camera around, gave you the microphone and asked you, explain the kingdom of God. How would you go? Probably really good. <laughs> Probably, you know, probably good, but would there be some holes in it? Would there be some things that you might not know about the kingdom of God? Yeah. 
And so I want to, I guess, just really open the door as we take a break for two weeks now and ask you guys to look at what is the kingdom of God and what is the gospel. Two separate things. The kingdom of God and the gospel. And and take those two statements, take those two descriptors, descriptors and and go away and, and search the Lord's heart and go, God, what what is the kingdom of God? What does it mean? Because there's so many kingdoms. There's the kingdom of men. There's the kingdom of this world. There's the kingdom of this age. There's the kingdom of David, the Davidic kingdom. What is the kingdom of God? And what's it concerned with? Where's it going? One of my questions last week was about Jacob in the Bible. Now, what's described as Jacob in the Bible? In particular, a nation. Israel is, is described, right? So it's, it's in the Bible, it's in Jeremiah chapter 30, and it says that Jacob is going to go through a time of trouble such as never been before. So where is Jacob going? Do I know that? How do I explain to my friends, my family, where Jacob is going if I don't know where Jacob is going? Is Jacob going somewhere? Maybe Jacob's not going somewhere. Have I even considered where Jacob is going? Is that too difficult? Is that doesn't deal with my situation right now? I've got circumstances, brother, that you know nothing of. I'm going through some stuff. Why should I care about Jacob? Well, because God cares about Jacob. Yeah. <laughs> We need to be concerned with the things that God is concerned for. And, and these things might seem, well, it doesn't make any sense to me. You don't know my situation. I've got things going on in my life. What, what can I affect? What can I change by knowing what the kingdom of God is? A whole lot. In fact, everything that you believe must transcend and filter through everything that God has so all God's plans and purposes are going ahead you've got to get onto his ground yeah he doesn't come onto your ground to sort out your namby pamby woe is me I've got problems don't you know don't you see Yes, he will provide for you in that journey, but you've got to get onto his ground and find out where he's going and, where, and what his plans are for his people. I've just explained to you almost the kingdom and the gospel in that one phrase. So how does restoration happen? Well, it comes through the apostolic and the prophetic ministry. See, if we just had a blank page, if we just walked into salvation right now and knew nothing, it would be easy to now explain the kingdom and explain the gospel. But sadly in Christendom, and I know most people in this room, including myself, have come from a long history of being in churches that have taught us wrong things about the kingdom and wrong things about the gospel. So there's much that we have to unlearn. So when you... When you do restoration in a house, there has to be a certain level of demolition. Do you agree? Yes. If you have to build a new kitchen, you have to demolish it to rebuild it. You even have to move out of that area and not use that area and use something else until that area is fixed. And the apostolic and the prophetic ministry 
are the demolishing ministry. They will come in with with saws, with drills, with big hammers, lots of muscle, and will knock over that thing until there's nothing left and will not be given any rest until what is false, what is wrong, what has to be restored is completely removed. The apostolic person, the, the prophetic person in the church, a true apostolic person and a true prophetic person will not be satisfied until everything that is false has been removed. And when the falsehood is gone, then we can start building again. The apostolic person wants to build. But that's not his first job or her first job. Their first job is to get rid of the false. Get rid of what is broken because who wants to build a nice kitchen on top of a broken kitchen or an ugly kitchen? Do you want to put marble on top of linoleum? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. You want to utterly demolish everything that is false, everything that is old, and then build. And sadly, in church, in the church system, this ministry is, is not received well. We don't like the apostolic because it's knocking things over, our sacred cows, things that we've held on to, things we've believed, things that have been faithfully ours, even good things from God that we've received, personal experiences and revelations and things like that. Suddenly an, an apostle or a prophetic person or a messenger will come in and go, Yep, that that's, was good then, but not now. You've got to grow up. And I'm going to knock that thing out of your hand and you're going to have to let go of it. And they'll constantly point you to Christ. They'll constantly point you to the Word of God. They'll constantly point you to Israel's history. And then you might get bugged out and go, well, why do they focus on Israel so much? No one else is. Why are they? Why are they concerned with Israel? Why are they concerned with the Old Testament? No one else is. Why the Old Covenant? We've moved on, haven't we, brother? And this is part of the offense. Looking at the Old. Why do we have to look at the Old Covenant? Well, because it wasn't laid up properly in the first we don't have the proper foundation of the Word of God. As we've spoken about many times here at Fireplace, sadly, our experience, my personal experience was, I didn't have enough of Bible laid up in my life when I grew up as a young boy in a Christian household. I grew up in one of the biggest charismatic movements in the Southern Hemisphere. In fact, I grew up in the, the nexus, the, the locus, the very the place where the whole Hillsong movement was birthed. The greatest charismatic outpouring in New Zealand, in, in Wellington and Lower Hutt in particular, the Lower Hutt AOG. Ministers from around the world would come and minister there because there was a fire and a grace being poured out. Ministries were birthed out of that place. Good ones and bad ones. But even in all that birthing and all that ex spiritual excitement and, and power and miracles, sadly, what wasn't being laid up was foundations apostolic and prophetic ones plenty of pastoral foundations plenty of evangelistic foundations but nothing that was concrete that would give me a real foundation of the kingdom of God and the gospel what is the gospel what is the kingdom of God
So we've covered Wrecking Ball Ministries. <laughs> <laughs> and, and sadly, this year, we've had people that have left. That the Wrecking Ball has been presented, or not presented, it's always been going. <laughs> we, what we minister here at Fireplace doesn't change doesn't matter who walks through the door. The same ministry, whatever, whatever the messages God has given us, we will steward and we'll continue to give it. To one, it's a joy and it's a blessing. To another, it's, it's an offense. And the, the part that's offended is the part that has to give something up, has to give up a belief, has to give up a, a mode of living. I've now got to come to the end of myself. I've now got to give up everything that I've prior or previously known. And, and now they're telling me that it's not enough just to attend. I've actually got to seek the Lord until I'm found by Him. And that's what will cost you everything. I've actually got to give my life. That's what the gospel is, isn't it? It's a giving up of your life. It's a giving over of your life to Christ. So no longer do I get to just select what courses I want to do in future years unless it comes through a filter of what he wants. I don't get to pick jobs that I want to go and do unless it's filtered through him. So... Let's go to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3. Here's your verse. <laughs> this is the kingdom of God. This is what I want to talk about a little bit today, just to whet your appetite for the two weeks break that we're going to take. Isaiah 2.3 says, The kingdom promised to David and his children forever. There we go. That sounds like the kingdom of God, doesn't it? The kingdom promised to David. Isaiah 2 verse 3. Yeah. And then it will say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, there's that word, that he may teach us his ways and we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Go to Matthew 6.10. So there's the Old Testament foundation. And there's many others that we can look at, but that's just, we'll get, just give one. And anybody can quote Matthew 6.10 without even looking at their Bible? <laughs> Doesn't it sound like something that you've said before, maybe? Sounds like the Lord's Prayer? Your kingdom come... Your will be done. So now it's now as a believer and someone as part of his kingdom, it's incumbent upon me or it's requisite, it's a requirement of, of my life as a believer to know the kingdom. Because I'm praying rubbish, aren't I, if I don't understand your kingdom come, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. You can say it over and over and over. Your whole life, your whole Christian life, you've memorized it in King James, New King James, NIV, ESV, NLT, um, the message, the passion. You can know it in every version. You can know it in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. But do you know what you're praying are you praying with, with any understanding?
What are you praying for? When you say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. I'm really praying that the end of the age would be finalized. I'm praying Jesus' return. Your kingdom come. That's the end, man. Like You've just prayed in the end of the age. Your kingdom come, your will be done. But we can have that now. And we ought to be praying that now. We ought to be living his kingdom now. So whose kingdom is it? God's. So let's put it into its right category. It's no longer my will. The gospel is not about my kingdom, my house, my calling, my the promises, the prophetic words over my life, where I'm going to school, what I'm going to do when I grow up. It's now about his kingdom and his will. Now, God will set parameters around our lives for us that are permissible areas that we can move into in education and professional training, tertiary education, onto doing certain jobs. But there's also parameters that we can cross over that he doesn't want us to go into. But you can still pray his kingdom come while you're an accountant, while you're a lawyer, while you're a doctor, while you're a nurse, while you're a truck driver, while you're a construction worker. It doesn't matter. His kingdom can be made manifest through your life and whatever you do. It doesn't, your job doesn't define you, is what I'm trying to say. But we also need to be careful about what we give ourselves to in the way of education and the workplace. It's got to be filtered through his kingdom. It's got to line up with his plan, his purposes. So we've figured out we've figured out that there is a kingdom and it's in Isaiah two three. You'll find out more as you go into it that it's actually part of the Davidic covenant. So we might talk about that more next time. We'll see. We know whose kingdom it is. It's not ours, but it's his. And we might even see that... Shall we go into Ezekiel 37? Yeah, we'll go there. Ezekiel 37, the very famous dry bones passage. We've taught about that. We've heard about it for years, haven't we? Dry bones and can these bones live? You know, so much can be said about even that phrase itself why would why would the angel of the Lord ask Ezekiel can these bones live and and more importantly why would the prophet Ezekiel say Lord you would know what prevented Ezekiel from not having a testimony where he knew that those bones could live. What prevented him from going, these bones can live and they shall live, bringing the very word of the Lord? Because later on, God would say to him, command these bones. There's something about commanding God. We're not even going to get into this today. This is probably a little bit deep for where we're at now but unless and until you can come to a position in God where you command him by the word of the Lord those bones will not live they cannot live until the prophet would come to a recognition and an acknowledgement of who God is and an assurance within their own spirit that Unless they command and they know what the command is, that those bones will not live. That God would condescend, God would allow himself and, and give himself over to man 
and instruct man with God's own heart and spirit by his breath. And it talks about, it just depends on the version you've got, but it talks about a wind coming from the four corners of the earth, bringing life to those bones. The version I like says that the breath will come. So you're commanding God's breath to come. Those bones cannot live unless it comes out of your mouth. <laughs> How can we just walk through this life in happenstance, you know, light-hearted, casual um, living? That is not the kingdom of God and that is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what the church has got to come back to, a restoration of this type of ministry. This is what we're called to. Why is this in your Bible? Not for your entertainment or for your Sunday school pleasure. This is for your learning that you would grow up into this. <clears throat> Ezekiel 37 <clears throat> verse 24. My servant David will be king over them. David is already dead when this is written. Yeah, But the prophet says, My servant David will be king over them, and there will be one shepherd over all of them. That's Christ. They will follow my ordinances and keep, my, keep and observe my statutes. They will live in the land that I gave my servant Jacob, where your fathers lived. Geography. God cares about that nation. What, what's he talking about here? The people of Israel. This is not yet fulfilled. Yes, they're back in the land. 1948, they were, they were formed as a nation. But they're not all back there. And they're not all living in this condition of righteousness. They will follow my ordinances and keep and observe my statutes. Really? Are they doing that? Even out of all the Jews living in the world, there's only a very small percentage that are orthodox. And orthodox Judaism is unsaved, burning in hell every day of the week. It's deception. Is that okay? It's okay to say that in the church of Jesus Christ? That your orthodoxy, your Judaism, is taking you to hell. It's only Christ that can save until they acknowledge Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour, Jesus would say to Simeon, the, the teacher of Israel in John chapter 3, unless you are born again. And how is it that you don't know these things? Born again? But the, word, the phrase born again has never been used before. How would Simeon know that? Yet Jesus would, would rebuke him, go, but you're a teacher of Israel, you should know these things. Because Isaiah would talk about can a nation be born in a day, Isaiah 66, 8. And how was David saved? Well, the same way that you and I are saved. He was born again. <gasps> a lot of the church would freak out right there. What do you mean he was born again? You can't be born again unless Jesus came. Really? Where was John the Baptist? Was he born again or was he unsaved? Was Zephaniah the prophet born again? Was Zechariah the prophet born again? Was Malachi? Was, it goes on and on and on. Of course they were born again. Of course they were saved. Of course they were redeemed. Of course they are with the Lord now. Verse 25. They will live in the land that I gave my servant Jacob as your fathers lived. They will live there forever with their children and grandchildren. My servant David will be their prince forever, and I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and multiply them. I will set my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God. They will be my people. Then the nations will know I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is among them forever. Has this been fulfilled? Absolutely not. 
this is the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 24, 15 says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the ends of the world. What's Jesus just been talking about in Matthew 24? The destruction of mankind, the destruction of Israel, the destruction of Jerusalem. And he says in the context, and this gospel will be preached to the ends of the till the ends of the earth. This gospel of the kingdom. This is good news. But how much of the gospel that you received when you got saved included this stuff? Really? That much? So we need to know what the gospel is. It's not just a confessional, because that's no better than Catholicism, making a statement. You might be born again, <clears throat> but what are you born into? And how long will that salvation last you? Until and unless you come on board with the kingdom message of the gospel. See, God's going to choose for himself a person like David. Selfless. <laughs> everything about the Davidic kingdom, everything about the kingdom of God is selfless, is other-centered. It's not concerned with bureaucracy, red tape. The kingdom of God that's coming on the earth is one of selflessness of love, of mercy, of tenderness, of gentleness, self-control. It's the spirit of a shepherd. So we're not there yet. But we're going to have what's in us restored back to what is the kingdom of God? What is the message of the kingdom? What is the gospel of the kingdom? Do I know? Can I articulate what the kingdom of God is? We need to break that down in our own lives and hearts. It's not enough just to come and attend and hear Chris bang on about it. You need to know. Because if I get taken out by a bus on Monday, then it's up to you. Yeah? God will even allow that to happen so you go out there and find out for yourselves. Who talks like that? I do. Yes. So, very simply, and I'll wrap up. God's got unfinished business with his natural branches, Israel. That is the kingdom of God. That is the gospel. That is the good news. And if the Gentile church, you and I, are unaware of that, and have no place for that in our gospel message, then our gospel message is, is light on. It's not the full gospel message. It's something less or other. And if it's less or other than the truth, what is it? It's a lie. I'm promoting the lie. And much of the Western church is promoting a lie that has replaced Israel if not totally, mostly. And we'll throw them five cents in a dish or maybe visit Israel or maybe give some money to an Israeli-type ministry or go and see a Jewish man come in and explain about the Hebrew alphabet to you. And we'll satisfy ourselves that that's sufficient, that's a sufficient amount of love for Israel that's needed and that's what will see them saved in their day of trial during their time of calamity. Really? The Lord's looking for the Corrie ten boom in your life, in your heart, who would identify and even go through a time of Jacob's trouble with Jacob while they're in the midst of their calamity, while they've been thrown into prison. Those who identify with them will be thrown in with them. Corrie ten boom's dad, Corrie ten boom's sister, brother went into prison 
So until and unless we have this as part of the gospel message, that we have a consideration, not just a flagrant disregard for Israel, but a deep concern as David did, as Ezekiel did, as Jeremiah did. Jeremiah wept. Jeremiah couldn't believe the burden that was upon his life as a prophet for these hard and stubborn people, this nation. And yet his ministry was to continue to rebuke and warn and correct and bring judgment. That's your job. You're meant to stir them to jealousy, Romans 11. What have you got? Do you have the kingdom message? Do you have the kingdom gospel? Do you know the everlasting gospel, the everlasting covenant? I'll finish up with a couple of verses. Isaiah 55, verse 3. Incline your ear to me, listen so that your soul may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant. My loving devotion promised to David. Who's he addressing? Israel. Listen so your soul may live. <laughs> How does faith come? By hearing. You won't get this unless you hear it. And you won't get this from another. Behold, I have made him a witness to the nations, a leader and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon a nation you do not know, and nations who do not know you will run to you. For the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, has bestowed glory on you. Nations are going to go running to that nation. It hasn't happened yet. It's coming. But this is the gospel. This is the good news. Isaiah would say through the pro or God would say through Isaiah the prophet, incline your ear to me and listen that your soul may live. This is part of life giving salvific um, strength and hope to the hearer. Isaiah sixty one, verse starting in verse six. Isaiah sixty one verse six. But you will be called the priests of the Lord. They will speak of you as ministers of our God. Are they doing that? Is Israel operating as a priest to the nations? Not yet. But that's their calling, and Isaiah didn't make that up. Isaiah got that from the covenant he saw from God to Abraham, that they would be a ministry of priests to the nations. That's what's coming in the millennium. Yeah, the millennial reign of Christ is going to be ruling and reigning from Zion. Yeah, and His law will go out from Jerusalem. So, in verse um, verse seven, instead of shame, my people will have double portion. Instead of humiliation, they will rejoice in their share. It hasn't happened. And so they will inherit a double portion in their land and everlasting joy will be theirs. Everlasting joy. See, we can write songs about it, but we don't believe it. We don't really believe it for them. In fact, we don't really regard it as all. It's something that's a bit ethereal, it's a bit out there, it's nice poetic language, it's prophetic speak, but do I really believe it for that nation and for that people? And do I even care about them? This is the gospel. This is what Gentiles, we're supposed to have this living within us, resounding within us, and a burden upon us that we would stir them to jealousy. If we don't know their plight, we don't know what they're in or under, being promised, how can we help them? How can we assist them in their flight in the wilderness to come? Well, we're too busy about buying our boats and having our holidays and, and you know, going up the ladder socially or becoming a better speaker or becoming a better person to be concerned about this. 
says that um, for I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and iniquity. In my faithfulness, I will give them their recompense and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations, then their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. This is parts of the garments of salvation, guys. This is having this laid up in your own spirit. He has wrapped me in a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom wears a priestly headdress. As a bride adorns herself with her jewels. This is bridal love. This is concern for another, guys. This is not... The, the bride is making herself ready for the return of Christ. And the bride won't be ready until we're all ready. We've got that lovely saying, don't we, in, in COVID terms that, well, we're not all safe until we're all safe. Yeah? Well, the church in Israel are not they're distinct groups, but they're not meant to be apart. They're supposed to be together. We're not all bridal until we're all bridal. And what are we doing about it? Are we even concerned or, or much worse, even aware that this is, this is part of God's plan? Zechariah 8.23, and this is what the Lord of hosts says, In those days ten men from the nations of every tongue will tightly grasp the robe of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. It hasn't happened This gospel of the kingdom is awaiting messengers that will carry this message. It won't come, this message won't come to people who are living tepid, half baked Christian lives. Predictable Christianity won't be able to carry this message, won't have the legs to hold it. How beautiful are the feet of those that bring good news? What do those feet look like running across the wilderness? They're bloodied and they're bruised. They're cut. They need, they need care and, and they need treatment. <laughs> it's going to cost you something to carry this message. So, here's our homework. We'd go away and find out what the kingdom of God is. We'd make sure that we're proclaiming a, a message of the kingdom that's not independent of Israel. A kingdom message independent of Israel is a lie. I just said it. I can't make it any plainer. <laughs> a king, I'll say it again. A kingdom message that is independent of God's plan for Israel is a lie. Because it's always concerned with the things God is concerned for. God doesn't change. So the burden that was on Ezekiel's heart hasn't changed it's been handed over to you the burden on Jeremiah's heart on Isaiah's heart it didn't stop when they, they stopped living in fact it was written for our edification for our learning that we would pick up the baton and run with it don't let this life and what's currently promoted through the church system dull your senses to what God has called you to it's a message that is is rejected 
by this age, by the powers of the air, you will be hated for this message. The powers of the air will do everything to oppose this message. And haven't they been successful? 52 on Monday. This message is so foreign, you've actually got to go looking for it. It was brought into my life through, a, through another messenger called Arthur Katz, who you've heard me quote a number of times, who was rejected by every major denomination and even by his own people, who was a Jew. He would teach in Jerusalem on a regular basis and they loved his message until he got to this stuff. Then they hated him and wouldn't receive him or welcome him anymore. And that's when it really broke him. And it wasn't long after that that he died, passed away. Not from the, I mean, he was very, very broken that his own people rejected him, but <clears throat> he died of an illness. He died quite late in life, but he, he had a very foreign message to the church because it made requirement of you. It made requirement of the church. It made requirement of mankind. You had to be something other than Christian. Yeah. He was jealous for words. He was jealous for meaning. He was jealous for what God was jealous for. He was jealous for God's glory. And, and that's so foreign. And everything in this life will cause you to calm down, brother. Calm down, sister. Don't get too intense. But I tell you, when the fire of God hits you, when, when these scriptures come alive to you, you can't shut up. There's a, a zeal for the house of God that performs it. And you'll find that in scripture. Even before Jesus... Um, well, before it said of Jesus in Matthew. That's what I'm talking about. If it's apostolic, if it's prophetic, it's concerned for the message of the kingdom and it's concerned for the gospel. So I better know what those things are. What is the gospel and what is the kingdom? Yeah? Amen. Awesome. Father, we thank you for your word today. Thank you for 2021. Lord, that we've seen much. We've, we've been through four terms of the school of ministry. We've been through up to 52 Sundays. Um, I'm not sure how many there are, but there's at least 50 Sundays this calendar year. Much has been laid up, much has been shared, much has been preached, much has been received, much has been prayed. And Lord, we can't break it all down into one sitting. But Lord, that you would categorize in, in all of the hearts that are here today and prioritize all the things that were to take into 2022. Lord, that you would pour out a burden, Lord, for your kingdom, a burden for the gospel, the true gospel a true understanding of the things that concern you, the burdens that are, have been on your servants, Lord, that you're seeking to find rest, Lord, in a people, even in this room, even watching by video. Lord, if this message just hits one person, Lord, it will turn the world upside down. Lord, I bless each one here, Lord. I, I thank you that you will continue to multiply and sow, Lord, the truth of the kingdom and the truth of the gospel, Lord, in their hearts. Lord, we know that your word says, to whom much has been given, much is required. And that there's those in this room that have paid a price and are going to pay a greater price for the call of God on their lives but we'll 
perform miracles and wonders and signs on the earth that have never been seen. The turning of, of men's hearts to you. Such a conviction, such a such a heart for the things that that bring you joy, such a heart for the things that bring your glory. Or may we be concerned about your glory and the things that glorify you. Forgive us, Lord, for focusing on ourselves, Lord, even in this time of Christmas or taking for ourselves time or things or food or another portion or whatever it is or that appeals to the flesh or with no regard for for others or the or no regard for the things that are on your heart or may we continually come back to what pleases you Lord, I bless each one. Protect them, Lord, over this break. Protect them on the roads, I pray. Protect them as they come and go. Protect them as they fly. Protect them, Lord, as they sail or whatever mode of transport they'd be in, Lord, that your hand of protection be upon them. We praise you. We lift up the name of Jesus Christ over this place. Over these lives, may your name be exalted and lifted up forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.